Hello, I'm Eric Anderson, lead pastor of Global Outreach Community Church. And I wanna welcome you to our online worship gathering. Here at GOCC, we are a church focused on growing people to be leaders in their families and communities, spreading the love of Jesus throughout the world. I want to invite you to engage with us today so that we can connect with you. Feel free to comment, like, or share today's worship gathering. I also want to invite you to join us in person on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. Humble Middle School in Humble, Texas. Check us out on all of our social media platforms and visit our website at globaloutreachcc.org. Lastly, I want you to know that your life matters because you matter to Christ. Join us as we worship God together. they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad for so many reasons to be in the house of prayer or in the house of the Lord, because anything that you need can be found in the house. If you need joy, how many of you know that it is in the house of the Lord? If you need peace, guess what? You can find peace in the house. If you need deliverance, you can find deliverance in the house of the Lord. So we're just glad to see you this morning. We welcome you to our online visitors and all of those, all of you God's children that have join with us to worship with us this morning. We ask that you would stand as we prepare to worship a true and living God. As we prepare to give a worthy God a worthy praise. How many of you know that he is worthy of every praise? He is worthy of every hallelujah. He is worthy of every thank you Jesus. And the mere fact that he allowed you to open your eyes this morning. I know some of you believe that it was the alarm clock but my former pastor used to say that the Lord touch you with his finger of love. So since he touched you this morning, allowed you to open your eyes, gave you the activities of your limbs, why don't you go ahead and wave your hands and tell him thank you this morning. Tell him hallelujah this morning as we prepare to give you praise. God, we just worship and adore you this morning. God, we don't take lightly that you've given us another opportunity to enter into your gates, God. So we come in with thanksgiving, God. We come in with praise, God. We come in ready to receive everything, God, that you God, have for us this morning, God, because we know that you are so worthy, God, of every praise, God, of every hallelujah. God, if we had 10,000 times, God, it wouldn't be enough to thank you, Father, for all that you've done. So, God, saturate this place with your presence right now in the name of Jesus, God. Holy Spirit, stand up on the inside of us, God, as we stand before you to worship you, to give you praise, God. Bless this service, Father, and let everything that God occurs here this morning be done. God, to give you praise, God, to give you glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you today. Yes. Come on, let's lift him up, Lord. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. And we come to clap our hands. I raise a hallelujah. Come on, help us sing it. In the presence of my enemies. Can we do it? I raise a hallelujah. Louder than the unbelief. Come on, let's chase that out the room. I raise a hallelujah. You found my weapon is a melody. Yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. I raise a hallelujah.
silence the enemy is with your song. Hallelujah. Can you silence the enemy with your song this morning? Because I'm going to sing in the middle of a storm. Louder and louder. Come on, sometimes we got to make noise so we can interrupt the sound that's Hallelujah. going through our ears today. Yes, so can we clap our hands? Woo. And can we make some noise that silence Hallelujah. the voice of the enemy? Yes, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. We're here for you, God. Glory to your name, I said God. we're here for you. Yes. Come on, all of our praise and all of our worship is for you, Lord. Yes, God. Hallelujah. Let our praise. Be your welcome and let our song, let it be a sign that we are here for you. Yes, God. My God, we are here for you. Why don't you open your heart today and say, let your breath, let your breath come, come from, from heaven. heaven. Fill our heart with new Fill life. Our heart with new life. With your life. We are here. For we you. are here for you. Hallelujah. Come on, help us sing that today. We are here for you. All over the room, to you our hearts are open. Come on. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. and say, let us shout. shout, be your anthem, be your anthem, your renown, your renown, fill the sky, fill the sky, we are here for you, we are here for you, oh yes we are, we're here to do this worship we and praise, we are here for you, because we love you Lord, and let your word move in let power, your word let it move in move power, in power. Come on, we declare that what's dead, that what's dead.
because you're welcome here. Hallelujah. We know that yes, mountains God. are still being moved. Yes, God. And strongholds are still being loosed. Yes, God. Hallelujah. Lord, we believe, and yes, we can see it. Can anybody see it today? Yes. Hallelujah. That the wonders that you still want to do. Yes, God. And we believe that bodies are still being raised. Yes, God. And giants are still being slain. Yes. God, we believe. Yes, God. And yes, we can see it. Hallelujah. Ah. That wonders are still what you do. Yes, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He still does. Bless your name, God. Glory to your name, God. Hallelujah. We are here for you. Yes. Come and do what you do. Yes. We are here. right where you are this Hallelujah. morning can yes, we just God. build an altar you, Jesus. I can hear the voice Hallelujah. of my mother telling me as I was entering into the Houston airwaves yes, to be a new God. bride before you can step into any new thing you got to learn to build an altar of sacrifice yes. and I know we know that when we think of an altar in the Old Testament we think of something that that 
that had a fire and something that may have been gold. And, but what I think of is the most valuable thing yes. that I possess. <laughs> and for some of us, it may be our name. Yes, it may be our reputation. It may be that I'm Mr. So-and-so or I'm Ms. So-and-so. And I just learned in the presence of God, yes. God said, give me your title. Hallelujah. Give me who you are, mother, father, president, CEO, coach. Whoever you are, the greatest of you, can you become the least in the presence of God? Yes. Yes. Can you Hallelujah. see him high and lifted up? Yes. When King Isaiah died, he said, I saw the Lord. Yes. Some things have to die around us. Yes. The idea of our issues and our problems, we have to say, God, you're greater. So, Father, right now, even in this atmosphere, we don't know all that's going on. But I thank God that I can connect my hand to you in the spirit realm. Yes. God. And the worship team, we're connecting Hallelujah. all over, whether wherever you yes. are. Yes. Hallelujah. Online, we're connecting with you. Yes, God. And we're saying, oh, God. Hey Amen. As I was sitting there, I just felt led to do this real quick. Uh, I'm going to ask if Selvin, if you would come real quick. Selvin, real quick. Can we celebrate God for Selvin as he comes? Hey Amen. We know we have a few families out. I want to pray for him. Uh, Mr. Battle, I know that you're on the camera. If you would come up here this morning, please. Mr. Felix, if you would come. Doc, if you would come. I'm just asking men. Is that all right this morning? Amen. Brock, if you would come, if I forgot about you, please forgive me. I'm a little blind back here. I have glasses on. I'm going to tell you why I want to pray for this brother this morning. Um, thank God for what he's doing in his life. Selvin had surgery two weeks ago. I'm glad that he's listening to the doctor, that he's taking his time to heal. And I just want to share with this church, um, they put a tube in his side to drain fluid out of his midsection around his heart. So I would say in the last year and a half, his brother's had three surgeries. We're asking God to touch and heal his body. I'm not sure if he got his results back. He goes Monday. They took lymph nodes out of his aorta lower part and they sent him for testing some of you who are guests today you don't know this brother had cancer almost two years ago and God healed him there and if he healed him then God is still the same God yes, he is. yesterday today and forevermore so I'm asking this church if you would agree with me that God will give a favorable report on tomorrow that we're believing God for God's best, that this brother is healed. And I don't know about you, I was challenged, and I thought about you doing the message. Hey, I know you want to be at the business, but be content. I know you want to take care of your family, but stay content. I don't know what God has for you, but I do trust God, and I trust God will for his life. So if you don't mind, if you would stretch your hand toward this way, we want to touch and agree that God will do only what he can. Father, we thank you now in the name of Jesus. God, we start by praising you for being the great shepherd. Thank you for being the great physician. Thank you that you are a healer. Thank you that you know how to save, deliver, and set free. Thank you that you designed the human body. You know every cell, every part of our body. And we thank you that you are the only true, living, and wise God. Thank you, God, that you're not only in heaven, but you are on earth through the spirit of the living God. So, God, we touch and agree in the name of Jesus for our brother Selvin. Thank you that you saved him. Thank you that you delivered him. Thank you that he belongs to you. And we start by pleading the blood of Jesus. God, we plead the blood of Jesus over Selvin's mind that when he starts to stress, that you would replace that anxiety with your peace, that same peace that surpasses all understanding. We pray that that peace would just cover his mind. We pray that that peace would cover Jocelyn's mind. We pray that that peace would be in their homes. We pray that that peace will be over their children. God, may they walk in peace, live in peace, Think in peace. God, let peace that surpasses all understanding cover this family. 
And then, God, we pray for his body. God, we pray that this body will line up with your word. God, we pray, God, that you would touch and heal this man of God like never before. God, we believe that you are a healer. So we pray that your will be done in the name of Jesus. Your will be done in the name of Jesus. Your will be done in the name of Jesus. God, thank you that you've brought him through three surgeries. Tubes in and out of his body. Aches and pains, hard times of breathing. And God, he stands here before us as a living testimony of your greatness, of your grandeur, of your who you are. And we thank you this morning. So God, would you touch this man of God? Continue to show yourself faithful. And then we pray on tomorrow for a favorable report. God, we do pray on tomorrow for a favorable report, God. And we just believe you right now in the name of Jesus for a favorable report. God, do something so supernaturally that it only points back to you. And God, we declare victory. God, we declare victory right now. God, we declare victory in the name of Jesus. And then God wise on my heart. I pray for any other who may be facing a physical ailment. Would you touch and heal their bodies? Would you show your power within them? Thank you that you're able. And as we close today, we close with that great doxology. Now unto him who's able to do exceedingly. God, we thank you that you are able to go before and beyond our wildest dreams and our thoughts and even our imagination. Now unto him who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. According to that power that is at work within us. To him be glory, both now and forevermore. We thank you, Jesus. We celebrate you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. Can we celebrate God for Selvin this morning? Amen. I just wanted to encourage his brother. Global family, thank you for partnering with us as we serve our local community and our international partners. Your partnership allows us to fulfill our vision of growing people to be leaders in their family and communities, spreading the love of Jesus throughout the world. Through your faithfulness, we're able to serve snacks to families at one of our local elementary schools, host our annual Thanksgiving Boxes of Love event, bless families in the urban inner city area through our Gifts of Love event, as well as partner with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes International Ministry. As you pray through giving, you can give two ways. You can give online at globaloutreachcc.org or you can give through our text to give at 281-809 Six seven seven eight. Giving is a privilege and a responsibility to those who receive from God the gift of eternal life. And as we give from a biblical perspective and motives in line with biblical principles and priorities, God will bless with results. Thank you for partnering with us financially. So today we're going to get into the Word, and we're starting a brand new series. And this series is entitled, It All Belongs to Him. We want to go through a series of messages helping you understand that God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And not only that, but everything in this life, in this world, belongs to Him. And so my title, my message today is this, we have everything we need in Christ. So turn with me to Philippians 4, Philippians 4, chapter 10. Philippians 4, chapter 10. Now I'm going to read from the Amplified Version because it brings this passage of Scripture out. But Philippians 4, chapter 10, it reads this, it says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that now at last you have renewed your concern for me. 
you were concerned about me before, but you had no opportunity to show it. Now, Paul is talking to the Philippian church, and he's excited because they have an opportunity to give to them, to him in his ministry, support him. Now, he's excited because they didn't know where he was. He's in prison. They hadn't heard from him. They didn't know what was going on. And so one of Paul's co-laborers connected with him in order to bring the gifts to him. So he said, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that now at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned about me, but you had no opportunity. Verse 11 says this, not that I speak from any personal need, for I have learned to be content, self-sufficient through Christ, satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or uneasy, regardless of my circumstance. Amen. I pray I can get there. Verse 12 says, I know how to get along and live humbly in difficult times. And I also know how to enjoy abundance and live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing life. Whether well-fed or going hungry, whether having an abundance or being in need, I can do all things which he has called me to do. Through him who strengthens me and empowers me to fulfill his purpose, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for anything and equal to anything. Through him who infuses me with inner strength and confident peace. We have everything we need in Christ. Paul got to a place in his life where he had to learn how to be content. It wasn't the skill that he was given. It wasn't a gift. This is something that he's experienced. He's basically going through life, and he's at the height where he has abundance and prosperity, and then he's facing times where he's at the lowest of the low. And he, like most people, whether they're successful, got all this money, or they barely just have enough, Paul realizes something. No matter what my circumstances are in life, I can be content because what I have in Christ. See, there's no difference from somebody who's making a lot of money and somebody who just barely have enough, right? There's no difference. Here's why. They both want more. Never satisfied. Somebody who started out $30,000 a year, God increases them, now they're making 80. They're like, man, I wish I can get to 100. They get 100,000, like, man, but so-and-so got 200,000. So they're trying to get to 200,000. They want more. Now their motive, is, it varies. Some people want more because they are afraid of going back to where they came out of. Some people want more because they're just simply greedy. Y'all have seen the, the show sometimes, American Greed. Y'all see how some people started out with just a little simple business trying to earn money, and once they started seeing the checks coming in, they was like, how can I get more? There's a story about this king. This king was wealthy. He had a lot of demands on his life, but he was stressed out, overworked, and he was tired. And one day, he noticed his servant, and he noticed that his servant was, was excited, was happy, and was content. And he kept scratching his head, wondering, how is it that he's content with life, and he has just enough. So one day he called this servant over and said, hey, come here, I want to ask you something. I've been watching your life, and I'm noticing that you're just happy, right? You, you're a servant. You don't have any rights or privileges, but you're content with life. Tell me, what's the secret? He said, oh, I have everything that I need. I got my wife. I got my kids. Yeah, I work hard. I enjoy my work. He said, I have everything I need. I don't need more. So the king was still perplexed, and so he went to his wise minister, and he asked his minister, he said, I, I, I'm just still confused that this servant who barely has enough is satisfied with life. He's content, and I'm trying to figure out why he doesn't want more. And the wise minister said this. He said, oh, he's not a part of the 99 Club. He said, the 99 Club? He said, what is this? He said, the 99 Club. He said, well, I'll, I'll show you. So the wise minister goes to the servant's house, drops off a bag of coins, leaves. The next day, the servant comes out the door. He sees these coins, and he looked at them. He started counting them. You know how you find money. You're like, hold on, is that, is that a 50, a 100? Picks it up. He starts counting the coins, and he realized he only got the 99 coins. He's like, oh, my God, like, where's the other one? Surely can't, somebody can't drop 99. There has to be another coin. It has to be 100. So he starts searching for this other coin, and he's exhausted, and he's tired, and he's like, you know what? I got to work so hard that I'm going to find this gold, this other coin. 
And so now he started overworking. He started becoming tired. He started stressing. He stopped spending time with his family. And he got to the place where he was stressed out. And the wise minister went to the king. He said, see, he's part of the 99 club. What is the 99 club? The 99 club is this. It's a name given to those people who have enough to be happy but are never content because they're always yearning and striving for that extra one, telling themselves, let me get that one final thing, and then I'll be happy with life. You know the danger, is, you know the danger in saying this thing right here? If I can only get, if I can only have, if I can only do, if I can only be, then I will be happy. If I just, ooh, if I just get this new job and making, this, making more money, then I'll be happy. And that's saying that we're basically basing our joy and our peace on things, on circumstances. And we say this a lot. If I can only change my body to look a certain way, whoo, I'll be good. Amen, right? Because we feel like if we get to this other destination, this other destination will meet every need that we have, will make us content. And once we get there, we're still not satisfied. Most people get, make, are making more money than they ever made before and still not satisfied. Most people lost the weight that they needed to uh, lose, but they still not satisfied. And there are things in this life, there are people in this life that makes us discontent. What is discontent? It's when you think that you don't, what you have in Christ is not enough. Didn't, Paul, didn't um, the serpent do this to Eve? He came to her, made her feel discontent. She had everything that she needed in God, in the garden. He provided for her every need. Her and Adam and Eve provided for everything. But they got to the point in their life, she was like, there's more. There's more. I don't, God's holding back. So she steps out to go get the one thing that he says you can't have, and she sins, which messes up her relationships which messes, messed up everybody else because now we got to deal with this human nature that crave and strives and wants more and more and more and more and more. We're never satisfied. The enemy has a, well, I'll say this. The world has done a great job of making us feel discontent. Just get on social media. Just watch the news. Watch your reality TV shows. Watch who you follow, who you look up to. Don't we see stuff and you're like, ooh, look, ooh, what she got on? Oh, I, well, I need that skirt. We look at the body. Oh, if I, oh, my nose just looked like that, girl. How, whew, I'll be looking fine. Right? We, we are looking at things trying to find fulfillment in them. We are trying to get the next big thing, and we are telling ourselves, if I can only get, if I can only be, or if I can only do, then I'll be happy. And that's the lie from the enemy. So let me help you understand something. When Paul says, I've learned how to be content, this word in the Greek means self-sufficient. Or self-rule. Paul is, it's interesting that he uses this word because it's a word that the Greek philosophers, Greek philosophers use, right? People in Stoic, they believe that they were self-sufficient, that whatever they faced in life, they had everything that they need. They didn't need no aid, no outside support, that they had everything they need within themselves to meet the demands of life. And so they went about thinking, man, I, I, I can do all things. I can do it, right? They pointed to themselves, which now takes them from uh, being dependent upon someone to be saying that I can do it myself, which leads to pride. So they got to a place where I'm self-sufficient. So Paul's using this word because he wants people to understand, like, yes, like we, we, have, we are self-sufficient, but it's only through Christ, not within ourselves. He said, listen, I do not know how to live uh, with a little bit and be okay with it. I don't know how to enjoy this abundance and be okay with it. Why? Because I still want more. So Paul's realizing, like, I am, I'm self-sufficient, but it's only through Christ, not through me. But sometimes that's not enough for us. So we feel like we need to go get more. Here's what content is. It's knowing and being completely satisfied that what we have in Christ is enough. It is enough. Do you not understand that you are a child of God, that you are a son and daughter, that everything that we need our Father takes care of? Why would he save you to let you? Why would he save you and not provide for your every? Like, why would he bring you into his family and not take care of you? That would not make him a good, good father. 
He is a good father. Why? Because he takes care of those who are his family. So we have to understand that we have to know and be completely satisfied that with Christ or in Christ, we have everything we need. Second Peter, Second Peter 3 says, God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Everything. And you know what? It makes, it makes God feel, you know, I think he, I, my sanctifying imagination, I think he feels some type of way when you have to step outside of him to go get your needs met. Think about this. If you're if in relationships, don't you feel some type of way if your spouse has to step out of your marriage to go get their needs met somewhere else? And Christ is looking like, hold on, we in a relationship. Am I not enough? I have not given you enough. My peace, my presence, everything that you need was in me. You're not satisfied that you got to go to the world and get your needs met? You have to go strive and do all of this that I never told you to do because you feel like where you have, what you have in me is not enough. And I don't think that sometimes in Christianity we've done a good job of letting people know that in Christ we have everything. We keep telling people, hey, no, no, just go do this, just go do this, because that's our society. Our society is telling us to go get more, to go strive. And that's, if you see it, people are losing their families because they're out trying to get more. People don't know when to call it quits. They don't know when enough is enough. Remember that Lay's commercial? Uh, the commercial, bet you can't eat just one? They let you know that, listen, you eat just one cheddar chip, you're going to keep coming back, keep getting some more. You won't be satisfied. And Christ is saying, man, when I saved your life and I changed you, that should have been enough for you to be like, oh, I can go to God and get everything that I need. I can get wisdom if I'm facing difficulty. I can get wisdom if I don't, ha- don't know how to deal with the situation concerning my job. I- God can give me the-, the ability to love people. Like, we have everything that we need. Our source comes from him. Now, let me take this picture right here. So, so years ago, I saw this, um, this documentary called Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. And he was saying that, you know, which, is, which blew my mind. He was like, you know, people that eat on junk food, that, you know, fast food, he said they always feel like they're satisfied, that they're full. Right? And they're not. Like, it's, like, it's like your mind being tricked. You're eating this stuff, you're like, oh, it's good, it's good, but it's temporary. And it doesn't really fool you up. That's, that's why you got to go keep getting more. You got to keep eating it, keep eating it. I was eating some chocolate last night. I kept going back to it because it was good, but it wasn't filling me up. But they were saying that when you eat the real stuff, when you eat healthy food, you're satisfied and you're full a lot longer. What I'm trying to say is that when you're in the world, when you're going to the world stuff, when you're trying to go get the stuff that the enemy tempt you with, it's only going to meet your need temporarily. You got to keep going back to it to get your needs met. But in Christ, the real thing, when you chew on the words of scripture, when you chew on in prayers, it's in prayer. When you get into Christ, you have the real stuff. You're satisfied a lot longer. This is why Paul said I had to learn how to do this. I had to learn how to do this because every time I face circumstances, I'm always feeling discontent. I'm trying to figure out why. I have enough, but why am I not satisfied? Yeah, I just have enough, but I don't, I'm not satisfied. It's in Christ that fills everything that we have in here because his human nature is never satisfied. If you look at your life and you can ask yourself, there's some things that you probably know you shouldn't have bought, but you bought on impulse because if you got it, that's a real thing. People, go, when they stressed out, they go shopping. Amen. You go get in everything. You look at your bank account like, woo, because discontentment will make you spend money on stuff you know you don't need. So we chew, so we eating on stuff. So we, so we filling ourselves up with stuff that don't satisfy us. And I'm telling you to get in the real thing that satisfies you completely, which is in Christ. So listen, there's a uh, y'all know this. Jesus is the plug. He's the plug. He's the source. And when I grew up in the projects, you know, everybody had a plug. You had to connect. Somebody, you knew somebody who was going to New York coming back with the, with the Tommy Hill figure jacket, the Nautica. I don't, y'all don't remember that. But they would come back with the J's. Anything that you need. You was like, hey, I need to get so-and-so. Oh, I got a plug. I got to connect. And they would connect you with the person who was the source who had the stuff that you need. And what I'm telling you is that Jesus is the plug. So when people need a savior, Jesus is the plug. When people need wisdom, Jesus is the plug. When Jesus need love, I mean, when you need love, Jesus is the plug. Whatever you need, he is the plug. He got what you need. He's the source. So why are we going to resources that can't really fill us? Jesus is the source. He's the plug. And this is why in John 15, he tells us if we're abiding in him. He said, listen, I'm the vine, you're the branch. 
You can't do anything outside of me. You can't live this life in your own strength. You can't do what he's calling you to do in your own strength. This is why he tells Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, my grace is sufficient for you in your limitations, in your weakness. Whatever you don't, whatever you don't have, I feel like you have enough of, God says my grace is enough for you. I am enough for you. I can carry you through this, but I need you to be dependent upon me. Jesus is the plug. I'm almost done. So we're going to go to verse 13. He says this, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, right? He who empowers me. He goes through this. He's really like, I'm self-sufficient in Christ and I'm ready for anything and I'm equal to anything. So we can say this, Jesus will give us what we need for whatever we face, have to face. And he will do it at the, at the exact time, at the right time. He'll give you what you need. You have a business problem. He has a business solution. You have a spiritual problem, he has a spiritual solution. You have a family problem, he has a family solution. You have a work problem, he has a, you have a conflict, whatever issue that you got, he will give you what you need at the right time, whatever you have to face. And so this is when we're in Christ, we can go to him. This is why, like, listen, in prayer, when I am focused on God in prayer, when I get up in the morning and I, my life is centered around him and I'm making him the focal point, I am content. But the problem sometimes is after I leave my prayer time in the closet and I start going about my day, you forget what you prayed about and you start running into life. And you start, your mind just straight got off of Jesus. Something happened, you're like, oh my God, what? Like you forgot all the stuff you were just praying this morning. You was in serenity. You was like, Lord, just I love you. Oh my God, praise the Lord. And then you going about your day, you was like, oh my, like what's going on? It's the moment, the day by day that you have to learn how to continue to go back to God. This is why he said, pray without ceasing. Don't stop talking to God. When I came to North Carolina, I was going to school. I had a a lady. She was kind of mentoring me in in, in Christ. And she said to me, she said, when you get down to school, she said, you're going to an HBCU. You're leaving a PWI, which is a private white institution, and you're going to an HBCU, historically black college, right, for those who don't know. When you're going down there, you're going to run into some temptation. What I want you to do is when you go to class, when you go to practice, when you go into the cafeteria, I want you to constantly talk to God. And I was like, what? I'm, not, I mean, I'm praying in the morning. I'm good. She's like, no, no, no. I want you to constantly get in the habit of talking to God. She's like, because you're going to run into some stuff that's going to make you uh, feel tempted to get outside of Christ. So I was like, okay. So I came down. I was praying. I'm you know, praying and talking to Jesus. I'm going back and forth. I'm praying. I'm praying. I'm praying. And I see what she mean because I was, I was seeing a different girl every day. And I was like, whoa. This HBCU is real. Whoa. I'm with my people. And I'm seeing dudes walking down the street, they breaking their neck. They're like, oh, my God. And they was like, what's wrong with you? I was talking to you. I'm like, I ain't Father God. Hallelujah. You're good. You enough. You can keep me. I'm single, but you can keep. I was talking to God because I realized, Lord, I am weak. And if you don't give me the strength, I'm going to fall back into sin. God, I realize that I don't have enough to meet this need, God. But if you don't show up in my life, I'm going to go get it from somewhere else. So I'm saying I need the habit of talking to God because he's my source. Is he your source? Can he give you everything that you need for the, to meet the demands of life? So we can say this with confidence. I, through Christ, can handle anything that life throws at me. I, through Christ, can handle anything that life throws at me. If you don't believe that, I promise you, you won't stay in Christ. You'll step out the will of God to go get something else, and it will ruin you. Listen, sin is accessible. When you go into a store trying to eat right, what they have before you? Candy and chips? You got to look for the real stuff. Sin is accessible. It's pleasurable. It's enjoyable. But it's temporary. And it will take you to a place that you don't want to go and keep you there longer than you want to stay. This is why you, in Christ, you can get every need that you have fulfilled in him. He is enough. And, and we have, the reason why we have to keep chewing on this is because the world will tell us that it's not. The world will make you feel that what you make is not enough. They tell you, go get more. You get on social media. Ah, look at me, I'm just doing, I just bought, a, you know what I'm saying, some more stuff. Look at the business booming and growing. And they'll make you feel like, man, my stuff is not, why my stuff is not like that? Why do I don't have this? Why does my family don't look like that? You'll start comparing and then you start doing what he tells us not to do. We start coveting. We start wanting what other people have. Because we feel like, oh, man, they look happy. And if I got that, it may make me happy. No. In Christ. No matter if I'm high, no matter what I have, if I have more than enough 
or even low. I can enjoy life regardless. I don't have to get this stuff to add to me. Jesus is not something that you add on. Christianity is not something you add to your life. It's your life. And we have to do a better job of encouraging each other to stay in Christ. So I'll leave you with this. Three benchmarks of being content. All right, realize you have everything that you need in Christ. This is an indicator when you're walking in, in this contentment, knowing that you have everything in hell. Enjoyment. Paul said, listen, when I have abundance and prosperity, I enjoyed it. Can you enjoy what you have where you are without wanting more? Can you be okay with that? Like, like literally, when you are enjoying something, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm good. I don't need more. But most people, when they get the abundance and they get the stuff, it's a fear of either going back to poverty or they, gonna have, they have a fear of losing it or they just feel like if I could just get another one, I'll be set up. Can you enjoy what you have without trying to strive to go get more? You've been praying that God would increase you financially and he's got you there, but you're like, oh, God, if you could just add on another zero. Like, is that going to make a difference? He's giving you what you asked for and you're still asking for more. The second one is resourceful. When you just have enough, Paul was like, oh, I know how to get along. Paul probably was in the hood. So like, if you're in the hood, like, hey, listen, my mom was resourceful. Let that knee patch go out. She was putting another patch on that thing, right? Shoes go out. Oh, I got you. I'm going to clean them up. I'm going to put some thing at the bottom of duct tape. When you're good. Like, we're going we're gonna to make do with what we have. So when you just have enough, can you be resourceful? Without saying, oh, man, if I just had this, it changed my life. No, you can enjoy it. You can be resourceful. And the last one is the expectation. The expectation knowing that our Father is going to supply and meet every need that we have. Hebrews 13 and 5. Let your character, your moral essence, your inner nature be free from the love of money. Basically, he's saying, shun greed. Don't be greedy. Right? Don't be greedy. Be financially ethical. Quit trying to get more. Quit trying to get, go to these quick, rich, get squeams and thinking like you just throw in $5, $10, whatever. That's why people playing the lottery. I, if you playing the lottery, I ain't, I ain't knocking you. I'm just saying, why you? If I just hit this and get a meal, you know most people who get all that stuff, they go back being broke. It's not enough. So he's saying, listen, be, be, don't be greedy. But being content with what you, what you have, this is what you need to hold on to. He said this, I will never, under any circumstances, desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support, nor will I in any degree leave you helpless, nor will I forsake or let you down. Relax, my hold is on your life. And no, no, God is in any circumstance, your mind, I will take care of you. I will make sure you have everything that you need. As a parent with children, I make sure my kid have everything that they need. You don't think that God will do the same thing? I mean, my mom used to tell me, don't be asking nobody else to, to take care of you. I'm your parent. I will take care of you. Don't ask nobody else for money. I got you on this. It is, it is a disrespect when we feel like that God can't meet every need that we have, that we got to go to somebody else. I would, I would feel some type of way if my son or my wife had to go to somebody else to get their need met because I couldn't do it. When I am the responsible, I'm the head, I'm the leader, I'm the father, I should be doing that. That's my job. And so when I pray and I go into God, I'm praying the will of God. God, you gave me a wife. You gave me a family. These are the needs that I have to take care of the family that you gave me. Amen? So if I'm praying in the will of God, I can expect that he will supply my need. He tell me, they're under, no, under any circumstance, nor I will give up. I will not give up on you or leave you without support. So if he's called you to do something, if he's given you a business or whatever situation that you're in, he will give you what you need to meet the demands of life. So I, through Christ, can handle anything that life throw at me. Amen. So I need you to understand, you have everything you need in Christ. Don't try to be sufficient and be independent or doing it on your own. You can't. You can't do this life on your own. You can't get to where you are. You can be, you can be successful in the world's eyes and still be a failure in God's eyes. You can go get the stuff that the world's telling you to come get, but God was like, man, I, that's not, that's not, that wasn't part of my will. You're stressed out and you're struggling because you're getting something I never, I could have gave you this. Listen, the Bible says in Proverbs, the blessings of the Lord make us rich, not sorrowful. So if he blessed you with the car and you're struggling to make the payments, was that God? Was that God? If he, if he gave you the house and you're struggling to keep up with was that God? Did you go get it outside of him because you were trying to impress somebody else who won't even be in your life in the next 10 years or so or five? We have to get to a place where, man, I'm satisfied. Listen, I ain't move. I can enjoy what I have. I can be resourceful, and I can expect whatever I need, God's going to supply my need. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go before God in prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord. 
that, God, we have everything in you, that we can be content in this life, knowing, God, that this world's resources can't satisfy us. But we, you are a source. You are the plug. So, our Father, I pray, God, that you will help us daily run to you, seek after you, pray and talk to you and say, cry out and say, Lord, this is my need. Lord, this is what I'm asking you for according to your will. You promised that you would supply my need. Paul found himself being content, wasn't craving what somebody else had. He could have easily looked at the other apostles and said, God, well, they got everything that they need. Paul learned how to enjoy Christ no matter his circumstances. And so, Father, I pray that we learn how to enjoy you, that we learn how to worship and honor you, Lord. Father, forgive us for disrespecting you, for going outside your will. Forgive us for going to get things, God, that you never encouraged us to go get. Forgive us, God, that we had, we had a desire for more because we realized, God, we felt like nothing in you was enough. Father, you are enough. Help us to walk in this truth. Help us to live out this truth that you can only satisfy every need. Father, because you are good. You will not be a good father if you let your children be in lack. You will not be a good father if you don't take care of your children. That means, God, you will be a liar. And the Bible says that you cannot lie. So if you cannot lie, then God, show up and help so that we can be an example to this world that everything that we need is in Christ. That we can point people to the plug. <laughs> That whatever they're struggling with, we can let them know that there's contentment, there's satisfaction in Christ. So, Father, I, I, I pray today is there's, I'm making an appeal for those who don't know Christ. Or maybe you felt like you knew him at one point and you fell off. The appeal is this. Come home. Surrender and give your life to Christ. Repent from any sin, no matter where you find yourself at financially, no matter how much debt you have, whatever you felt like. You, you might feel like, man, I ruined it. I messed up, God. I, I can't come to you. He was like, I'm, no, I'm not asking you to be perfect. I'm asking you to take where you are and come to me. Wow, what a great time in the Lord. Thank you so much for watching GOCC Online. We hope you were blessed by today's message. If you made a decision to follow Christ, or if you would like to take the next step in the faith journey, or you would love to receive prayer, we would love to connect with you. Visit us online at globaloutreachcc.org, click on the Get Connected link, scroll down to the bottom of the page, and then click on the Prayer Request link. If you would like to partner with us financially, you can give online at globaloutreachcc.org, or through text to give, at 281-809-6778. Again, I want to personally invite you to join us next Sunday, 9.30 a.m. at Humble Middle School in the Atascacita area. God bless you and have a great week.